The giant panda, or just panda, is native to south-central China, and while the dragon is seen as a major national symbol for the country, the panda could be seen as just as iconic around the world. It's won over the hearts of millions by being generally lazy and affable. Pandas have recently been moved out of endangered status and into vulnerable due to the discovery that the wild panda population had risen by 16%. Even with the increase, there are only about 1,500 in the wild. Most exist in captivity or on reserves. This round bear is named from the Chinese words that translate to Big Bear Cat. And in Nepal, panda means bamboo eater. This has given the name to another unrelated animal. The red panda, also called the lesser panda or the red bear cat, is about the size of a house cat far smaller than the 200-pound Great Panda. The reddish-brown mammals are arboreal, which means they live in trees and are most active during the night. Even though this animal is smaller than the black and white panda, it is even higher up on the endangered list due to the fact that there are less than 10,000 mature red pandas in the wild. The good news is that in some areas of their home country, China, they are protected by law. Unfortunately, it hasn't stopped these animals from being victims of deforestation and, because of their size and appearance, are poached. Besides the name, the only thing these two share are their food of choice. Both are primarily herbivores, and bamboo is the main course. A great panda's diet consists 99% of it. Even in captivity, when they are given things like honey, fish, eggs, and fruit, they mostly eat bamboo shoots and leaves. Red pandas will eat insects and the occasional bird, however. Both of them are plagued with a similar problem that keep their populations low. Reproduction. Red pandas suffer from what is called inbreeding depression. It's caused when a gene pool for an organism isn't large enough to keep genetic disorders from occurring. The population's health depends on a minimal amount of inbreeding, but because of the low numbers of the animal, that is impossible. And because of that, each generation becomes weaker and less healthy. Great pandas have the opposite problem. Once captured, they lose interest in mating. The typical method to bear new cubs is by way of artificial insemination, but scientists have had more luck recently by observing the black bear, a thriving species. Paradoxically, the great panda are brought into captivity to help them live and keep them safe, but once they're there, they no longer want to breed. In 2014, new methods of breeding were established by freezing the seed and sending it to other zoos and sanctuaries, temporarily saving the species. Besides these animals keeping zoologists and scientists busy, pandas have become mascots, characters, and national icons for many people in China and around the world. Their seemingly soft, round, and non-threatening bodies, mixed with the big black spots that circle their eyes, make for an animal that check all the boxes for cuteness. The idea of what makes them, or anything, cute is called neoteny, or the retention of infantile features through adulthood. Large heads, big eyes, a round face, a head that joins immediately to the body with no neck, all have something in common, the characteristics of a human baby. Thus, why so many get that warm fuzzy feeling when seeing a dog, cat, panda, or even a toaster when drawn a certain way. In Japan and China, they are regularly used in television, movies, accessories, branding, and comics. One even served as the mascot for the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Jingjing was a fuwa, or good luck doll, and represented happiness, as well as his black color representing the black ring of the Olympics logo. Other appearances in popular culture include fast food logos, cartoon characters, and even the face of the World Wildlife Fund logo. They also serve a diplomatic importance, being the first gift exchanged between the People's Republic of China and the West in the 1970s. By 1984, however, they had stopped the practice and only loaned them out for 10 years at a time for a $1 million fee. Even though they were no longer gifts, the practice between the East and West became known as Panda Diplomacy. With all that's been said, it's interesting to note that even though ancient Chinese painters and artists depicted bears, and very often painted bamboo, there are no pre-20th century paintings of giant pandas. Not only that, but writings of them are minimal other than a couple of medicinal cures and tales that might be referring to the bear. 
The first sight of a panda for that part of the world was in 1869 by a French explorer named Armand David. Even then, he received a pelt of fur, not the living animal. That wouldn't occur until 1916, when a German zoologist bought a cub. Trade would open up in the next 15 years, and then dry up due to war. These animals, like so many others, have been blank canvases on which we paint our own ideas. They've been tokens for trade and profit. They've been cartoon characters, mascots and icons that millions would hold as their national symbol. Even though they seemingly haven't been around very long, and may not ever be around in great numbers, they will always mean something different for everyone.